and welcome to our very first uh, fellowship on numbers event for 2023. Uh, my name is Charlie. I work in Allianz as a reserving actuary, and uh, I'm going to be a host for this next 45 minutes. I think we're in for a treat because it's two topics that you wouldn't think come together: economics and the Bible. Uh, but we have the pleasure of Anthony Asher with us. Uh, hello, Anthony. It's good to see you. Hi, Charlie. Hello. Um, if you've been invited by someone and are wondering who we are, we are a network of people working in this broadly kind of numbers industry. We have actuaries, accountants, super professionals, um, and we are an open network where people of different faith and positions can come and explore um, all sorts of topics about the Bible, about these bigger questions of life beyond numbers. And along with quarterly events, we have uh, weekly small groups uh, to support one another. And I'll tell you more about those after the uh, after the Q and A, um, so for now, uh, Anthony, why don't you tell us what you've been up to in your retirement? Okay, so I got uh, voluntary redundancy from the University of New South Wales two years ago. I've been lecturing for nine years. I spent time in, as an actuary in Deloitte earlier than that, and um, APRA, and at the University of Advisement in South Africa earlier. So I've done half academic, half business currently. I'm back one day a week on a research project at UNSW. I'm more than one day a week, but they only pay me for lunch, um, which is the way it goes. Um, I'm on the Actuaries Institute Council. Um, I'm trying to work with, uh, with a retender and actuary or consultancy to try and promote actuary or uh, lifetime annuities, which is the research project as well. So, um, uh, and I'm playing bridge one afternoon a week as we're going on a, as I told you, we're going on a hike um, we're doing the, the, the um, overland track next week, which is kind of great. So we're doing more hikes than we used to. So I, my wife doesn't believe I'm retired. Yeah. <laughs> Except for the fact that the money's not coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is not an easy hike, guys. I did the hike. I did the overland in my late 20s and I barely made it. Um, cool. So it's <laughs> really impressive, Anthony. Um, do you have any advice for, uh, I mean, I'm sure retirement's far away from us, but uh, have you got any advice on how to retire well? Um, I don't think I'm, I can, I can't really give the advice because I haven't really retired at very, properly yet. But um, I think the, the idea is to keep a, a range of interests so that you, when the income stops, you've actually got things to do. Um, but you, you never know. I mean, like my wife spends most of her time babysitting. You know? We have um, 10 grandchildren, so there's a, there's a lot to do, and you couldn't, you couldn't predict that. And so, you've got to be flexible and live life, I think, in the current, but you know, be aware of what's going on. And of course, you know, contribute to your super, but I, <laughs> this, 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 this group knows that. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, 10 grandchildren, right? <laughs> Some kind of rostering or booking systems required. Them More that's yeah, right. that's right. The, the, the twins have their fifth birthday today. Well, nice. Ooh, have fun. So, about the topic today, um, you know, it's uh, it's it's interesting, right? We're talking about market design, which we haven't really. I wouldn't say it's a topic that's been well covered because it's people just take things for granted. Um, what's gotten you interested in exploring this topic in the first place? Um, so, what's led me into it now is the question of. Um, so, I'm I've been convening this retirement income working group at the Actors Institute since 2012, and we're trying to find out how to introduce lifetime annuities into what's going on. Um, and we've now got the products more or less lined up, but nothing's happening. And part of the issue, as you will all know, if you, well, probably most of you know, is that financial advice is a major issue. It's too expensive, difficult. One of the solutions to it is actually to get more data. Well, I think you, if, if the data could actually come from the, um, from the ATO and from my gov, because they, they know more about your numbers, your finances than you do even as actuaries, because they know your past salary, they know roughly what other people like you earn in the future. They can do a, pretty much a, a, with what you, they've got, particularly if you bring in the Medicare information, they can do a full financial plan on you that you know, really could blow your, blow, blow your socks off. Um, but the, um, that's not available. It should become available through the consumer data right, and if you come across the consumer data right, and the privacy, national privacy policy, principles that require someone with data on you to give it to you, but they need to give it to you in a, in a, in a format that is actually viable. So the question is, is, how can we do that? 
And one answer is, oh, the government should do it. But that's not, I mean, most of us would sort of, well, in fact, most actuaries, so I imagine most of you would say, hang on, are we happy with the government doing this thing? Can we not, should there not be a market involved here? And so I started thinking about it, and I, I, I've read over the number of years, the, um, the new, what now called the, they, they were called the new institutional economists, they're now not so new. At least 12 of the, depending how you argue, that my economist uh, uh, commented in my paper says, uh, don't, don't mention the number because they'll argue about it, but almost a dozen Nobel Prize, Nobel Memorial Prize winners have over the last 25 years won the, um, they won the Nobel, they have been institutional economists. It's mainstream. But although it's mainstream, it's not taught to first or second and often third year economics, and it hasn't sort of penetrated the, the way we think. So market design, so that's where I got into it. So how do you design markets in such a way that people um, the people are free. And I, so I, I thought what I would just mention here is that this distinction, the distinction that's really fundamental and involves our lives, is the difference between freedom from and freedom to. So you possibly have come across this before, but freedom from is freedom from rules. And it means that you're happy to do your own thing. But taken to its extreme, it basically says, I'm free to cheat you to spew my rubbish over you, to manipulate you, um, and to do my own thing at massive cost to other people. Now, clearly that can't be done. Freedom too is, is actually, it doesn't mean to say that we're free from norms or rules or anything, but we're free to become everything we were made to become, as you say with this question. But so, you, know, so we, um, you could say healthy, wealthy, and wise, which is a good way of mentioning it, but wealthy, perhaps we should think in terms of, of, of relationships, not, um, not just things, money and things. So that's the issue. So how do you design the markets to, um, in such a way that they don't, that you, you, not that you'd have freedom from rules because you need the rules to behave, but freedom to become everything, to be creative, to become innovative. So Ellen Ostrom, I'm going to quote, she said in a Nobel lecture in 2010, but, um, so and you're talking about institutions, so that's organizations and, and regulations. So it's, 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 she's a politician, a, public, a political scientist, not actually an economist, but those are kind of um, The institutions, we've been thinking of designing them so that to force or nudge entirely self-interested individuals to achieve better outcomes. Um, she says, her research, and she's done a huge amount of research, I mean, uh, mind-boggling how any one person can cover all the stuff. So you look all around the world at all sorts of different cultures and all sorts of different institutions to see how people can overcome the tragedy of the commons. So that's what if you've heard about that, but how, how they can collaborate. So her research has led you to argue that instead, a core goal of public policy should be to facilitate the development of institutions that bring out the best. So we don't want the worst, we want the best. And so the question is, how do you bring out the best to create what she calls innovation, learning, adapting, trustworthiness, levels of cooperation, and achievement of more effective, equitable, and sustainable outcomes at multiple levels? So that's the challenge. And OK, so I'm just operating financial services side of things, and that's where we are, but we can't obviously operate everywhere. But we need that general theory to get it. Mm. Yeah, to get it right. So can I just add, oh, I mean, it's talk too much, but on a personal level, the one thing, I, the idea that kept on coming to my mind um, is that regularly is the bit from two opinions about, we have renounced underhand ways, rather speaking the truth, we want to be trusted. I mean, that's basically what Paul's saying. Um, and the problem with, an un, with a market that's fragmented and full of people that are following their own desires, their own rules, their own, is that it becomes legitimate to lie. So, I mean, there's, we know when, we, when you enter into a negotiation, I mean, when you're negotiating for your salary increase, if you're in that category, or negotiating with someone else on a on, on a business deal, is it legitimate to deceive them a little bit? 
And the answer is, in many cases, it is. It's expected. You do not expect the car salesman to tell you that there's a problem with the car. That is in a, you know, maybe he has got to tell you it's an accident, but perhaps that it was driven hard. You've got to work it out yourself. Same for a house. It's buyer with buyer beware. And so the markets can be in situations of negotiation where you can't actually renounce underhand ways. You've got to be conscious of them all the time. And I think that's what that's what freedom too. We want to be free to speak the truth. Yeah. Um, before we continue, I just realized I forgot to tell you guys about the Q&A. So we're going to have about 10 minutes for Q&A afterwards. And there's a number on the handout that Martin's going to send around on the uh, um, on the Zoom chat. So if you do, if anything pops into your head, feel free to just um, yeah, send the text message to that number. Um, so Anthony, what are the way the markets currently work? What are some of the assumptions um, around the nature of competition? So this, this, I think, comes from the way in which we understand how we got here. Now, I mean, some of you may not believe in evolution, but let's just, just assume that there's something out there. A lot of people see evolution as, what is evolution? The survival of the fittest, yeah? And it's kill or be killed. Now, what you really need to do is to come on a bushwalk with me. Because it's not, it's not the fittest on the bushwalk. So the one we did this morning did that an hour around the, um, the beautiful blue gum, which is the other side of Hornsby. What do you see? Blue gums, and there's casuarinas, and there's sassafras, um, there's turpentine. So just, I'm just talking about the trees. They're black ones. Red gums, blue gums, <laughs> slurry gums. Down below, you've got Banksia, and you, um, and then the baronias, and the, national, the peas, and then Flannel flowers, which are quite fun, and then right, if you're really careful at the right time of year, you can find these little orchids, beautiful little flying duck orchids, which have sort of got fur on them, and flying duck on their eyes. Now, are they the fittest? No, it's clearly not the case. There's just, and I, that's just the numbers I know. There are hundreds of species and pods that have grown, that, 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 and then I'm not talking about insects and the birds and the um, whatever else, the snakes that are around them. What 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 are spiders that you don't want to know about? Um, or you need only to avoid that. Nature creates, evolution has created life, variety, tons of things, unnecessary beauty, peacock's feathers. Why are they got peacock's feathers? Oh, because it's sexual selection of all of this. Come on, mate. It's just beauty, it's just life. So that's what actually happens, survival of the fittest. There's been a debate about whether markets evolve or actually created. So there's a debate between, you might have come across Friedrich Hayek, who's a, um, a con an economist who's been dead for 60 years. Um, but um, he believed that as long as you followed appropriate ethical systems, the markets would just evolve to be created. But actually, when you look at it, they don't, they fragment. What we've got at the moment, sorry, they can evolve appropriately if people construct them appropriately, but they can also fragment. So we've got Alvin Roth, who won the prize, the Economics Prize for Market Design specifically, looked at the market for medical interns. So um, in the 30s, medical intern would be just when they started having appropriate degrees for doctors and then they went to hospitals for to become interns. You know, two months before you had your 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 um you, you graduate. If you then start looking for a hospital that you like, the other word, and the hospital started looking for people, appointing people. And then the smarter guys said, "Okay, well, actually, if I do it three months beforehand, um, I'll get a better. I'm more likely to get my position." And the smarter hospital said, "Oh, well, actually, if we go out a little bit earlier, we can get the good medical intent." And what happened is that sort of hopped and hopped and hopped. Eventually, at the end of their second year. Two years before, they were making, having been forced to make decisions about where they're going to, where they're going to go. And so, I, I, Roth looked at what had happened, and they developed a mechanism whereby there was a clearinghouse, and all the, all the decisions were made at once, two or three months before the time, and it maximised the chance of everyone getting their um, their hospital. Um, the hospital of choice, and it maximised the, ch the, the chance of the hospitals getting their interns of choice, and that makes sense. But you, they actually had to 
consciously go in and design it. And so that's that's what one, one, one's really talking about, that there needs to be this, sorry, markets can be developed appropriately if people go in and change them. Now, um, of course, we make mistakes. So it's, it's quite common for people to go in and try and change the design markets and make more of a mess than they started. That's not a reason not to try. It's a reason to be much more careful when you do it. Um, and certainly, I mean, well, yeah, that's, that's competition collaboration is is, 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 is quite important in this. Um, and what the Christian principle here is, um, and all I say here that some of these, we're talking here about the intersection between, well, I mean, third space, which we're under, meeting under the auspices, is the intersection between secular and spiritual. There's a sort of, and so, um, I mean, Jesus says to his disciples, if you want to be the greatest, you need a servant. And Rob Greenleaf, the management consultant, talked about servant leadership as the way in which you can actually develop organizations that work well. Um, but, it, you know, if, if you want to look, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, lots of stuff about the body of Christ, the church, people, organizations moving together. Peter Drucker puts it, the management writer, um, the purpose of organizations is to make people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. I'll say that again because I think it's a really a good thing. It's not that easy to do. The purpose of organizations make people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. So, I mean, the organization I'm currently involved with, um, we've got some guy who's really very energetic, but he cannot proofread for toffee. Um, so, the reports we get are really in need of some proofreading. But what, what's the story? Stop him from doing it, punish him for not proofreading, or get someone who actually is quite good at proofreading to read stuff. That's what organizations are about. We want a combination of energy and detail and whatnot, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so, thinking more about some of the, the underlying assumptions behind how a market works, um, what do they assume about the role of rules? Okay, this, yeah, so the rules are required for two purposes, really. The one is to restrain opportunists, the greedy and the, um, the exploiters. So, that's why we have don't, don't steal, don't lie, don't murder. Um, we have rules against these things because if there are people in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a market that are doing that, you've got to act. And that's why we're looking at the Royal Commission basically found people to taking fees from people that were there, getting served, charging for stuff that they didn't offer. That's, you need rules to contain those. Um, John Braithwaite is quite a good organizational theorist from ANU. He says, you, you know what, he talks about the regulatory pyramid, which used theoretically at the bottom the regulators if they are around should be encouraging people to be productive bringing the best out of people but then as people misbehave so you've got to get tougher and tougher and at the end if they really misbehave badly you've got to take them out of the market um, um, so the, so you need the rules for that but then you also need rules as guidelines so rules of the road if you like so we've got um yeah, the roads work because the, we all drive on the left and you need rules to stop you speeding, but you also need just ordinary things about when you come to a roundabout to look at the person. Then. So we, you, when you park, you make sure you park within the line so that everyone can park. So those are rules of the road to allow us to enjoy common goods more effectively. Um, in the current environment, it's pretty important because of it, the um, technology to work and to talk together needs interoperability. So my phone can talk to your Android or whatever, you know, the Android, because there are rules of interoperability that allow us to talk, allow them to talk to each other. When did that start? International Telegraph, 1865 became the International Telecommunications Union, which is allowed telephone. You can phone anywhere in the world because the things can link together and have done for decades. The Telegraph spoke from 1865 onwards. They started looking at the, um, 
irrelevant, they're interesting story. They started looking at um, radio waves in after the Titanic sunk. I don't know if you know, the Titanic was sending out emergency cries for help on one set of railway uh, air, airways run by Telefunken, and there was a boat nearby that was running on another set run by Marconi, and they didn't talk to each other. They had, in fact, specific instructions not to listen to people on the other, you know, to protect their um, uh, to, to pr protect their patents or whatever it was. So, I mean, there you have a situation, the market fragmented, and, you know, a thousand people lost their lives on the Titanic unnecessarily because we hadn't got there. So this this question of um, that need to we need to work out these rules that are um, um, that that allow us to to operate together. But the rules there are two types of rules. Well, there are many types of rules, but the two types I want. They're black letter rules and they're principles. And what we've fallen into here in Australia and all the world now is the idea that the rules should be detailed. So how many of you work on, have looked at Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act on financial, financial advice? I've just spent a couple of enjoyable days. <laughs> you know there are 1,100 pages? And you've got to, you've got to, I, I thought, oh, this is what they mean. It's by the lawyer. No, 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 no. You've got to look at the, uh, you can't look at financial advice, financial products based on the Corporations Act. You've got to look at the CIS Act. The CIS Act says that the different difference between a product, financial product that consists of a beneficial interest in a superannuation fund, not a financial product, the beneficial interest in a superannuation fund, which you will find in section 29TC of the CIS Act. And that defines what a my super product is, and the, which which in the definition section ten you will see is a choice product. And if you have a my super product, you may not as a superannuation fund phone up your member and say it's time you retire. Do you want do you want to come and talk to us? Or do you want to have a look at it? So anyway, sorry. I mean, yeah, this is something quite. If you're not involved with it at the moment, you, you you're still quite close to it. It's a disaster. So we've got these rules that effectively restrain us and stop, you know, stop innovation. Um, and they're actually also useless anyway, because, I mean, ASIC took Westpac to the High Court, five, three, two, a judgment and two appeals, five, eight, nine, nine judges made a judgment. And what was the story? Was was Westpac giving financial advice in terms of Section 76A of the, the Corpse Act, or was it giving general advice? Not whether the advice was good or not. This appeal specifically said, don't talk about whether it's good or, good or not. Is this, this is general advice, not financial advice. The judges said no, and they pinged them with 50 million bucks. What a waste of time. Okay, so we have this problem. So what should laws be? They laws actually should be principles. And this is something that um, is actually central to Paul's argument in Galatians. So in the New Testament, it's uh, and what Jesus, Jesus gets when he says the Sabbath was not made, uh, sorry, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. The rule to have a rest wasn't made to stop you from doing something useful on the Sabbath. It was there to have a rest so that we could actually... We, we could rest. So it's not the, the letter of the law, it's the spirit of the law that we've got to obey and got to absorb and got to follow. And that leads to collaboration in life. And I mean, and you know, like the Gilead from Galatians 5, Paul says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Do not stand firm, therefore, do not again submit to this yoke of slavery that you previously were under. So this is a question of, you know, under law. Or under grace, we need the spirit of the law, the freedom to stay on the left when you have to stay on the left. But you know, when the bicycle's there, you, don't, you drive around it. You don't stay on the left and crash it and push the cyclist into the side of the road or whatever you're going to do. So yeah, okay. that's um, rules. Rules are there to guide, not to restrict, and we are in trouble with a lot of. The, 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 um, 
the international competition authorities are out to put um, codes, detailed codes of conduct into the internet, into markets, etc. And they will be as bad as if you haven't dealt with Chapter 11, you call that. Maybe you've dealt with the Basel rules for Chapter or the oh, FS17, <laughs> if, you're, if you're lucky. Sorry, FS17 is an accounting rule. It spent 25 years developing and is, uh, is, I don't know how many pages there, but probably 1,100 pages. It's keeping the actual specific on some issues. Um, sorry. <laughs> I'm happy to argue if it's utterly useless, but um, not, not just, anyway, we won't get there. Um, sorry, so that, yeah, so that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's where it is. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, and uh, finally, uh, with the markets, with the way markets currently work, how do they, what do they assume um, about human behavior? Okay, well, I've spoken previously about fear and greed, uh, greed and fear, it's the dopamine and the adrenaline that, that drives us. Um, but, but, um, and that intrinsic motivation is what um, intrinsic being you, you had to get students to want to learn to want to know what was going on if you rewarded them by marks you had lost the plot because they're not going to become lifelong learners if they're not lifelong learners what you teach them will be forgotten so quickly that's not preferred first one so I, I just, I'll just take, you know the famous quote about the butcher, the baker, and the brewer? The, the baker, the brewer, Adam Smith's quote, he says, and it's, it's famous because it's meant to have this great insight into human motivation. Because he says, he says, we address ourselves not to their humanity, to but their self-love, and never talk to them of, their, of our own necessities, but of their advantage. So we don't expect the baker to provide us with bread because he likes us, but because he's making a living from it. So the story, the equivalent in the modern case, people don't know that quite often. Just listen, to read this, listen. How many of you buy meat? We address ourselves when we go to the butcher, not to their humanity, but to their self-love. We never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantage. So when you go into the butcher, what, what, what when Adam Smith went into the butcher, but I suspect he didn't go because he probably had a servant that went and didn't actually know how butchers behave. <laughs> Let's assume that he did go into the butcher and he did do what this says. He would say, I want a, I want a kilogram of that mutton, but I, you take off the fat and don't charge me for it because if you do, I won't come again next time. That's addressing him you to their self-interest. You don't go to the butcher and ask that, do you? You say, look, I'd like to give it, I do like to let lamb roast tonight. What do you reckon, you know, what, what have you got? Um, can you butterfly, can you remove the meat? And you'll say, no, actually, I think look, lamb is actually quite expensive at the moment, but you know, this, this pork is actually quite nice. And if you've got some applesauce, it's like, oh. that's how you talk with the butcher. And what's he talking about? Not to their humanity, because you're also probably asking them how is, uh, you know, probably if you know them well, you're asking them about how his arm was or whatever it was. Um, and he's asking to you why, you know, why you've recovered from your limp. Um, but, to the, you know, uh, never talk to them of our own necessities. Well, that's what you go to a butcher about. You talk to them of your necessities. I want this for tonight. What's the best joint you can offer me? So he's got entirely wrong. Entirely wrong. And this is a famous quote to say actually people are motivated by their own self. Okay. I've said enough. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, thank you for uh, that, those insights about uh, you know, your thoughts on the free market and some of the ideal ways that you would like to see it work.